Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Hamsite Helicon. Uh, this is Nathaniel W2NAF, and uh, we are, uh, I'm now recording, so this will go on to YouTube later. And I see we do have Stu just joined us. So today we're going to be having Rob Robinette, Stu Ogawa, Kevin Pierce, and Gwen Griffiths talk to us about uh, their Whisper Demon work. And uh, I have some ideas, and they have some ideas on how we might go forward with this. Um, but before we get to that, um, I think we'll just say some brief hellos. So try to keep it brief, uh, say who you are and you know where you're from and you know one comment if you want. So um, we'll just start off with, I'll, I'll start off with Bob. Go ahead, Bob Gersoff, WK2Y. Okay, um, I'm Bob WK2Y, which Nathaniel stole my thunder. Uh, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am jet lagged having just got back from my 45th Peace Corps reunion served in Nepal 9N1 land and uh, was able to meet uh, Father Moran during my time there. Unfortunately, they would not let me operate. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great, Bob. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, Bill, N-A-E-T. I think you're muted. Still muted. This mic is just not working. Yeah. All right, we'll come back to you. David, uh, A-D-8-Y. Greetings, I'm David. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm the faculty advisor of the Case Amateur Radio Club of Case Western Reserve University, W8EDU. And Whisper is really great. Take a look at W8EDU on 80, 40, 30, 20, and 10. Thanks. Great. And actually, if everyone could just put their name and call sign into the chat, that'll be a way of taking attendance today. So usually don't keep track of who's here, but it'd be nice. And I saw a group do this the other day. If you just put your name and call sign in the chat, that we will have a log. Um, great, Larry, Larry, Sarah, go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, Larry, N6NC, La Jolla, California. I've been doing a, a propagation project across the Pacific with uh, a professor at uh, Nagoya University. They have the super darn radar up in on Hokkaido Island. And uh, along with that project, I've kind of done a uh, modest interferometer with my uh, equipment here at home, which seems to be working pretty well. That's very good. And we're looking forward to hearing more about that in the future. Khan, Kilo 8 Echo Quebec Whiskey Bravo. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Khan, uh, call sign KEAQWB. Um, I'm a student at uh, Ohio State. Go Buckeyes. Um, and that's about it. Back to the net. Thank you. Dave, W6OQ. Ah, good noon, everyone. At least it's noon here. Um, Los Angeles, uh, just a hanger on, trying to learn enough about this to figure out a place to be useful. Thank you very much, Dave. Mike, AA8K. Michael Neruda, about an hour north of Detroit, amateur radio participant. Thank you, Mike. Dev, Kilo Charlie 3, Papa Victor Echo. I think you're muted, Dev. It's auto, auto decreases the mic, okay? Hello? So, uh, yes. So, all is well here in Scranton. We are resuming these Hansai telecoms, and I'm glad that uh, we are convening these. My uh, research is also going well. Thank you. Great. Let's see. Um, Diego? Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, Diego Sanchez, uh, KD2RLM, uh, and I'm an undergraduate student at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, and I'm working with Nathaniel on uh, his uh, ham radio LSTID study. Thanks. Rob Robinette, AI6VN. Oh, okay. Hello from um, Northern California near uh, Half Moon Bay, south of San Francisco. Um, i am uh, uh, been a member of the Hamside group since uh, Nathaniel introduced himself to me what, two or three years ago. I'm uh, very interested in Whisper uh, and have created a 
a software package called Whisper Demon, which is used uh, widely, almost you know maybe seventy five percent of the top spotting sites worldwide use this. It's a application pro program that uh, runs on a Linux server, uh, communicates currently with uh, uses uh, one or more uh, Kiwi SDRs uh, to uh, receive the whisper bands and post uh, uh, spots to WhisperNet as well as additional data uh, to our own database. And uh, that database includes, uh, in addition to the spots, includes background noise levels. Uh, data from uh, each uh, whisper cycle on every band. So we have a large uh, noise level database from many sites worldwide going back, I don't know, maybe a couple of years. And uh, that noise database, I think, is the uh, uh, one area of interest where uh, it's a unique database that might be uh, a source of uh, new insights into radio propagation. Thank you so much, Rob. And Stu, Whiskey Bravo 6, Yankee Romeo Whiskey. Sorry about that. <clears throat> clicking on the wrong thing here. Um, uh, Stu, out of uh, Silicon Valley, just south of uh, Half Moon Bay, actually at, at work right now, uh, down in Sunnyvale. Uh, actually can see Moffett Field from my office here. It's a very beautiful day here in the valley. Um, <clears throat> Took a 40 year hiatus from ham radio. I got my general class when I was uh, eight years old and life got in the way. Uh, finally came back into this um, after someone mentioned uh, my interest in uh, big data and digital communication. So I've actually only been um, resurrected in the past maybe three years. Um, got very interested in Whisper um, because at heart I was really an antenna builder growing up and I was very interested in being able to test. And so I was told to. Uh, Whisper would be a uh, phenomenal way to do that. Um, uh, one thing led to another, and um, Roland uh, HB9DUR, who some of you might know, had set up the International Beacon Project, and he reached out to me to uh, become one of the West Coast Beacon operators, and so I uh, I signed on to that, um, and uh, been operational since they basically started this out what, in August or so. Um, that's when uh, I met Rob uh, and uh, f f other folks like Gwen and um, Arnie, who are running the uh, driving the uh, Whisper Live site and giving them feedback. Um, and I think one of the reasons why <clears throat> there was an interest in my background was because I've done a lot of very, very large big data for uh, companies around the world. Um, two companies ago, we were moving in close to about 1.7 billion social conversations a day uh, from Twitter, Facebook. Uh, so we're doing a lot of uh, uh, real-time streaming of data and then doing math, running math and science on that. Uh, did similar work for Yahoo uh, during its, some of its heydays. And then uh, earlier in my career, I uh, was a GM uh, for all the analytic applications at Teradata, uh, kind of before big data was sexy and analytics was sexy. That's where I, I, I cut a lot of my teeth. So uh, that's just a short on myself. Uh, back to you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Stu. It's great to have you. JB, Kilo 8 Oscar Sierra. Yes, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a newbie here, so I don't have any new traffic. Um, I'm a mathematician and electrical engineer. My specialty is high performance computing and scientific computation. And so uh, what I'm doing is canvassing the various projects that, uh, that fall under uh, uh, the, what appears to be a massive uh, collection of projects uh, just to see uh, where I might be of most use. So that's about all I have today. I apologize for my disheveled appearance. I've been working 15 meter DX all morning. <laughs> so uh, that's what I've been doing. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, JB. Nice to meet you. Uh, John, NAOBJ. Okay, I'm John, NAOBJ, uh, lab director at Case Western's undergraduate design labs. Um, also the creator of the Grape One and currently working on Gen 2, Grape 2. So, do you need anything else? I think that's great. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I got in kind of late. I wasn't yeah. sure what I was supposed to do. So, yeah. back to net.
Thank you. Jay, WV8SBI. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, my fraternal brothers. Uh, Jay, Whiskey Bravo 8, Sierra Bravo, India, here in the Oakland County, Michigan, which is the next county north of Detroit. I am a retired automotive embedded software engineer. Uh, that's where I spent, a, with a couple of exceptions, uh, my uh, entire career. Uh, but I'm still active in the Society of Automotive Engineers on their cybersecurity uh, committees and uh, have participated in uh, one standard, one SAE. They don't call it a standard, it's a recommended practice, which is out there in the field and working on uh, another one right now, uh, 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 doing, doing a lot of work on another one right now. Uh, otherwise, just enjoying uh, working FT8 when the uh, propagation is in and when my antenna decides to cooperate. And uh, other than that, uh, uh, two years, uh, correction, three years, two months, and 30 days of blessed retirement. So some of you look forward to you guys that are still uh, pounding the bricks out there. Uh, with that, take care. Back to Nick. Great. Thank you so much, Jay. And then let's see, Dave McGaw, N1HAC. David? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Sometimes this mic doesn't work. David McGaw, N1HAC. I'm a uh, research engineer at Dartmouth College. Uh, we do uh, research into the aurora and the ionosphere from the ground, from uh, balloons, and from sounding rockets. Back to Net. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, see. Bill Engelke, AB4EJ. Yeah, Bill Engelke here. Um, I uh, am with the University of Alabama and um, heading up a lot of the software development for the personal space, space weather station project. So that's my story here. Back to Ned. Thank you, Gary. AF8A. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Gary AF8A. I'm a retired electrical engineer, an alum of CWRU, and uh, a general interest in, in all things ham -sci. Back to Ned. Thank you, Gary. Alice, N5DXZ. Hey, Alice, I'm in uh, Laurel, Maryland, first time here. Um, uh, let's see what else. Oh, uh, I've been off ham radio for quite a while, but I went down to HR Road today and bought an antenna, so I might be getting back on the, on the air very soon. Back to you guys. Thank you, Alice. Nice to meet you. And let's see. Um, uh, Bill, NQ6Z. Greetings. I'm Bill in Q6Z. I'm in Northern Virginia, and I'm currently trying to get uh, a system to collect whisper up at 80 degrees north using Wild Wild Net software and a bunch of Kiwis. Back to Net. Thank you, Bill. Sounds great. Bob, N4HY. Hey, guys. I'm Bob McGuire. I'm an uh, adjunct professor of electrical and computer engineering and some other stuff at Virginia Tech. I'm building an ionosan uh, on a large piece of property that Virginia Tech owns with a zigzag LPDA and using some modern software defined radios for a high dynamic range and wideband capabilities. Thank you very much, Bob. Let's see, Bill NAET, is your mic working? Well, let's see. Yep. Okay, yeah, I've, I've got to watch the audio because the uh, audio in this darn thing every once in a while just drops back, the gain drops back to zero and it'll disappear. So I've got that up on the screen so I can see it go. But uh, I'm in Northwest Ohio and uh, I had to had to watch this, this, this uh, talk today because about two days ago I got a Raspberry Pi 4 and I got Whisper running on it and it's running right here beside me now. So I'll be... Uh, listening with great interest to see what's going on. Go ahead, back to you. Thank you. Gareth, go ahead. KD2SAK, I think. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Gareth Perry, KD2SAK at NGIT in New Jersey. Um, not, I'm nothing, no traffic for me. I'm just uh, popping in just to, to listen to this talk. I'm, I'm multitasking. I'm, my ears are on another talk, too, and I'm trying to do lecture prep. So. I'll leave it at that. 
<laughs> nice to see everybody. It's excellent. It's like operating SO2R. Um, all right, and then um, we have uh, Kevin Pierce says he's listening uh, right now, but he can't speak, but he's here via Stu Ogawa. And then I think uh, Gwen Griffiths. I think we bring it over to you and then I think you can kick off our actual presentation. Uh, Gwyn Griffiths, Southampton, United Kingdom. So it's evening here for me. Uh, retired oceanographic research engineer uh, with interest in embedded systems and data analytics and uh, had a wonderful opportunity to use those skills and interests with Rob Robinette in Whisper, Whisper Demon and looking at data. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. All right, um, Rob, I think you said there were some slides to share and the floor is all yours. Oh, yeah. I, I'll, if I take uh, control of the screen. And, yes, it's gonna um, be uh, Gwen. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to share the second desktop and try to do a little bit live, but with some stored graphics as well. So um, up here in the black panel, uh, what we have is Arnie's Whisper Live uh, database with a Grafana uh, front end. So this is the quickest way of looking at uh, Whisper Demon noise data. And I, I guess the, the brief from you, Nathaniel, for this uh, call was uh, a quick summary on what might be traveling ionospheric disturbance signatures within the noise estimates made by Whisper Demon. So I'm trying to summarize it in, in three slides of this live display. So uh, we make two algorithmic estimates of noise in a Whisper signal. Uh, if anybody's interested in the details, I can send them. They were in a KiwiX article that I wrote with uh, Rob and Glenn Elmore and 6GN. Uh, there's an RMS estimate and an estimate based on the FFT uh, that looks at quiet um, frequencies within the whisper band and does that adaptively. Uh, and what we're showing here is level. This is at KPH uh, from April last year. So we're looking at the 8th of April, 2020 at KPH uh, on 40 meters and we're showing one day uh, of UTC time. So midnight UCC to midnight UTC. And there is a diurnal variation in the noise due to absorption in D layer and E layer. But then at times, one sees these intriguing sinusoidal fluctuations. They're generally not there during um, periods when the noise level uh, is low. So what are those uh, sinusoidal variations? Uh, sometimes one algorithm picks, the, picks them out better than another. So the, they're clearer here on the FFT noise level estimate, but they, they are present. You, you can see them in the RMS estimate as well. So let me... If this works, I've now dragged um, a PowerPoint screen up. And I guess this is the, uh, the, the start of possible interest in this was at uh, the 2019 TAPA ARRL Digital Communications Conference when Rob gave the presentation and I prepared a few data analytics slide on uh, what whisper demon might be used for. And at that time, we showed the 60 meter noise level measurements. Uh, so now we just have six hours on the X axis timescale from the 7th of June, 2019, again at KPH. And the noise level below virtually the Kiwi self noise limit. Uh, and then the level rises and a 10 minute uh, average, which is the line, um, clearly again showing these almost sinusoidal fluctuations. When one takes a power spectrum oh, they're not, they're not done yet. Right. over that period, uh, then that shows peaks 
here, and in particular this peak, um, I did this one as frequency in millihertz, so of the order of half a millihertz, which is equivalent uh, to a periods of um, 35 to, to 30 minutes. So are those shorter period fluctuations which catch the eye in the amplitude trace and also here on the spectrum, are they medium scale traveling ionospheric disturbances? And, and I guess, so that was back in 2019. And the uh, impotence now with uh, Stu and Kevin having joined in with Rob and with their background in, in machine learning, can one or look automatically at um, time series such as this uh, in the Whisper Demon noise record and learn something automatically about uh, traveling ionospheric disturbances. Because right now, what, what I do is uh, rather manual. And so I have gone through these records. Uh, I can go uh, a day at a time through the record and find ones that show interesting uh, possible wave trains. That one, not so obvious that day or that day, but there's the day. So I can then choose manually to analyze that. So we now should have had some four panels uh, of octave analysis pop up. So the first one here, top left, is just um, this time series, but added on a little bit uh, in octave. And what this also points out is that Grafana on this display doesn't display every point. It's subsampled and averaged um, depending on the time series, you, time period you select. Mm -hmm. So there's the actual data for that period. Um, I then uh, use a Hampel uh, median absolute deviation filter with seven points to clean it up. We're at the lower left figure. Um, and then here's an example where if we take the spectrum of that whole uh, 24 hour period, then what we see here, and, and now the, these are in cycles per day of the order of 20 cycles per day. So just over one hour period. Uh, so these fluctuations here are just over one hour period, but that's a spectrum of, of the whole 24 hour period. Um, in Octave, we can use a spec gram uh, to look at segments uh, of the 24 hours. So uh, taking uh, 128 uh, points and we have 23 uh, separate slices uh, during one day. Uh, so on the Y axis is the frequency in cycles per day. So going up from uh, five cycles per day to 100 cycles a day on the y-axis. And then time here is, is one day. And the color is an amplitude scale. Spectrum uh, comes up with its own amplitude estimate. So let's just forget that for the moment. We'll, we'll just look at the color variation. And I'll bring that up because it, it matches the uh, dimension here of the uh, Grafana display. And what we see that this picks up here clearly at uh, of the order of 20 cycles per day, we have this increase here at, uh, during you know, 0.25 to 0.75 of a day uh, that matches up when we see these sinusoidal-like fluctuations in the noise. So this is one way that uh, you know, we can analyze the data to try and perhaps pick out um, frequency bands of interest and find at what time intervals uh, they occur. Um, and so uh, that just summarizes the data I've just shown. But then you go to another day uh, where the eye looking at the FFT uh, is it's certainly not as obvious that there are fluctuations in the period of interest with periods of interest. But here on the spectrogram, 
again, it does pick them out. And again, it's picking them out at about the same time of day. So they are embedded within there. It's just not so obvious. And so I guess it, that's a quick summary of the Whisper Demon uh, noise database. Currently, one can look manually and do a manual analysis to try and look for TIDs. And I guess the challenge for Stu, Kevin and, and others is how, one, how might one use machine learning to pick out those features of interest? Thanks. Thank you so much. That looks great, Gwen. Um, I can certainly sympathize with picking out manual, doing a manual analysis of these things. Um, I did a lot of manual analysis of the MSTIDs in SuperDarn when I was in graduate school. I eventually did come up with a, an automated system of at least estimating the amount, the relative amount of uh, MSTIDs present. But yeah, this is a very worthwhile thing to do. And Diego, who's on the line here, he's done a lot of manual um, searching for the TIDs uh, in the uh, amateur radio data as well. Um, so I guess this is really good. Do you have any questions? Are there any questions from the group? Larry? You're muted, Larry. Uh, for Gwen, where were the measurements made, taken? That, that particular data set, both the initial one that sparked the interest in 2019 and that 2020 data set uh, from KPH, uh, Point Reyes, uh, Northern California, on which Rob is the expert. So let me hand over to Rob for a description of KPH. Uh, yes, KPH is a historic radio site that was established by the, Mac <clears throat> by the Marconi Corporation and Dr. Beveridge actually selected the site. It's in the uh, currently now the north of uh, the Point Reyes uh, National Seashore and is operated as a historic radio site. It was uh, uh, used uh, commercially until the late 90s to communicate uh, with marine uh, with, with ships ship to shore off seas uh, out in the Pacific. Uh, it is, uh, I think, the, the quietest site, uh, received site on the West Coast. And as you can see from the uh, diurnal variation in the background noise level, uh, we haven't found any, any other sites. I'm not sure I know of any other sites worldwide that actually show that level of diurnal variation. So you get very clean data sets uh, from KPH. Uh, it uses a single uh, TCI 530 antenna. Um, uh, which is a commercial omnidirectional antenna. Uh, and it has a bank of Kiwi SDRs that are uh, running, well, have been running 24 seven uh, and logging data both to the WhisperNet uh, database and this uh, noise data and extended data about the spots that it receives are logged to a database that uh, Gwen and I maintain uh, at a, a whisperdemon.org set of servers. Um, so uh, that site is available. You can log on to the SDRs there and uh, uh, listen and see, see you know, you know, li listen and see what's going on in the quality of the received site. Um, so we think the data sets, uh, it's, a, it's a very clean data set, although, I, you know, there are other sites uh, that are uh, quite good. Uh, and one, one of the uh, possibilities is to uh, look to correlate uh, the uh, noise analysis results among these sites that run Whisper Demon, uh, which are distributed around the world. Uh, we have one in, uh, I, I maintain one in Hawaii, a second one here south of San Francisco at KFS. Uh, uh, there's one in Utah, several in Nevada, uh, Europe, East Coast. So there's a, a network of uh, Whisper Demon running sites uh, around the world which uh, almost all of which are among the top most sensitive uh, whisper received sites in the world. So um, anyway, we have uh, uh, we have a much larger data set, but but it's uh, uh, and, and I think there's possibilities to analyze this, uh, especially both the spot and in particular the noise level data to try to uh, gain some insights by correlating 
uh, noise levels between different sites. I think we, uh, Gwen did such an analysis for us, and we we did think we uh, uh, we presented that at at a back at, at one of the Hamside conferences. Uh, such an analysis that uh, seemed to show uh, that the wave traveling from uh, Utah, we used the Utah site and uh, uh, correlated the, uh, the noise level data at Utah with that from KPH, which is about a thousand kilometers to the west. And we thought we saw the, uh, the wave moving. I think there's much more that could be done. It seems to me uh, that uh, one could gain a tremendous amount of uh, temporal and uh, spatial insights into the movement of these waves if one were to take the data from a group of sites, not just a single one. But doing so is, uh, is beyond uh, the, you know, a, a manual analysis. It really requires, uh, I think, a more, um, uh, you know, more insights uh, and, and more uh, compute power. And I think that's where uh, the uh, machine learning and uh, 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 algorithms could uh, give us insights that, that are just impractical for us to do manually. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. So. I was wondering, yeah, Stu, or do any of you have questions for us or for me? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking from a fire hose. I mean, I'm trying to uh, pick up, you know, and going through all the schemas of what we have that uh, Rob and Gwen have. So I'm a little remiss, I'm a little behind on getting through all that. Um, it seems to me though, I mean, I'm just, so excuse me, I know Gwen's probably, and, and Rob's probably sent me this documentation again, but, um, you know, one of the things that kind of pops up, I mean, I'm doing this right now for this new company I'm working at, doing the same level of analysis, uh, globally for, for, for a very different industry. But one of the things that keeps coming up, whether it was at Yahoo, uh, Sysmos, Teradata shops, um, is, you know, it's trying to define the features, the attributes mm -hmm. for this. And, um, you know, one of the challenges with machine learning, uh, or let's just call it deep learning, is knowing what the right question is to ask. I mean, hoping that, and, and many of you guys, I don't want to uh, 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 underestimate the firepower of your thought work here. So I'm, I'm uh, open to any of the suggestions from folks here that are familiar with that. But, um, you can spend a, a boatload of money and time on deep learning and get nothing out of it, mm. zero. And that has been replicated over and over and over here in the Valley, and I'm sure all over the world mm. with that problem. So just feeding it a whole bunch of data saying, we did a correlation. And then you answer, so what? Right. So what? Oh, there's a reservoir and there's a big dam there that's creating noise. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, I kind of excuse, saw that coming, right? Excuse me, may I, may I interject a question here, please? Go for it. Uh, when you say, or when machine learning is talked about here, are we talking supervised or unsupervised or both? We and don't, why? Uh, this uh, audience uh, may not even uh, have that background to even ask that question. Yeah, that's a great question. It's but, a profound, it's the center of this. <laughs> perfect. Right? Yes, exactly. So just sending a whole bunch of data over, you know, that you run into that, right? And one would argue, I mean, the good thing is with the data, uh, you know, in one geo, for example, uh, that Gwen has talked about, or uh, sorry, Rob's talked about, okay, you got a baseline of one data that's arguably maybe one of the quieter sites in the world. Maybe it's semi-supervised, back to your question, right? I don't know. But I think just putting a whole bunch of data in, unless we know what we're looking for, and some of those, uh, you know, the other thing is really the attributes, right? The features that are going to go to this thing. What are we going to learn from that? I don't even know what specifically. I mean, I'm sure someone's documented some of these attributes. I've seen the signal, the noise, and some of the other attributes, but that's not telling you. It's 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 more. I I can you know, tell it's, you it's what the, people what we typically look for when we're looking at traveling atmospheric disturbances. So we're we're typically trying to characterize certain parameters of the wave. So we want to characterize um, the period or the frequency of the wave. We want to be able to characterize the wavelength. We want to be able to characterize what direction it's propagating. We'd like to know how what the amplitude of the wave is. Um, some of those things 
we'd like to know how those things change with time. So even we say things are quasi periodic. So on the period may get typically gets longer with time. So you'd like to be able to measure that. You'd like to know how localized it is. So do you see the wave over at just over on the west coast of the United States? Do you see it on the east coast of the United States? Do you see it over the entire United States all at once? And really all of this is what all this is pointing back to is really the question is where are these waves coming from? What's generating these waves? Um, you know, and that's that's actually a complicated question itself because um, there are things that we know that can generate these waves. Like we know that the aurora um, is supposed to be a, a generator of traveling ionospheric disturbances. We know that um, things like hurricanes and tornadoes, they can generate them in a different manner. We know that waves that are from the bottom of the atmosphere can propagate up toward the top of the atmosphere, but that also happens in a complicated manner. So these things, so sometimes what the atmosphere is doing is it's actually modulating what waves can make it through and which ones can't. So um, basically what I'd say the first step with what you're trying to do is come up with a way of first detecting whether or not a wave is present at a particular station, being able to measure um, those wave properties. And then you want to be able to look at a number of stations in aggregate. You can think of them as multiple sensors and then use that to determine which way where the waves actually are and which way are they propagating. Does that really require machine learning though? Is that, yeah, is that I mean, a price right now, the answer is no. Yeah. yeah. Well, so yeah, you're right. The answer is probably, you know, possibly not. I mean, and again, this is, I'm telling you, this is what is traditionally done. Right. You know, there's, there's a number, many years of research on traveling atmospheric disturbances. And, and um, usually like for my PhD, when I did the, uh, automated approach for finding them, I ended up using spectral analysis techniques. So I used a bunch of FFTs and some variations on the theme to, um, to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, which, which way you want to do it, whether you want to do it with spectral techniques or whether you want to do it with machine learning, you know, that that's kind of up to in a way, since you're you're a volunteer and you're looking at how to do this, it's kind of your your choice, your prerogative. Um, similarly, I'm I'm working with uh, Bill Engelke here and some other people on looking at traveling ionospheric disturbances, not in the whisper noise, but in the whisper signal, and in the RBN and PSK reporter signal. And we're supposed to be using machine learning to try to figure out what what's the most likely driver that's causing the TIDs. So uh, we're supposed to say, you know, have a number of possibilities. Is it the Aurora? We'll put in the Auroral Electrojet Index. We'll put in the um, KP Index uh, for geomagnetic disturbances. We can put in the SIMH Index for geomagnetic disturbances. We can put in information about the polar vortex and mesospheric wind directions and see, and then use, use machine learning to see which of those is the potentially accounts for the main driving that we see. Yeah. So that's that's the approach we're going with right now. I, I think that's that, that's a smart move, uh, uh, Nat. I mean, you know, one of the things that always comes up, and, and we hear about it, you know, on the, I mean, I'm not in the academics, but again, I'm reading a lot of the technical white papers, is, is explainability. Well, yeah, you predicted, but tell me how you did it, right? right. I can't tell you. Was it Aurora? I don't know. <laughs> Was right. it a solar flare? I don't know, but this is yeah. the noise. We predicted right. it, but why, right? And that's right. that's the hard part. That's the million dollar yeah. question, right? And that's that's why I'm saying, be careful what you ask for, because you know, because you could spend a lot of money doing mm -hmm. this and a lot of resources, and you know, we all have limited amount of time and resources yeah. available to do that type of stuff. So I, that was my concern, is exactly what you're talking about, uh, Nat. Is you know, you you have a signal that's going from Utah to Point Reyes. Mm -hmm. On any given day, just like going down Highway 101 or 280 in the valley, there's traffic. Mm -hmm. Someone got caused an accident. Why did that happen? Right. I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. I left the Tesla on autopilot. I don't know. I was drinking my coffee and sneezing and backed into a car. I don't know, but it happened, right? It, it, it doesn't, it's not a very good explainability, but there's a lot of 
probably a million more reasons why in the ionosphere that there's a traffic problem and absorption occurring at whatever the layers are. So that's why I'm trying to really, I'm trying to grok mm -hmm. really what this is, you know, the purpose, you know, I, I understand noise is important, got it. It's yeah. probably the best thing that we can do. Yeah. Um, but it, it's- so, so the, the yeah, the, the important purpose, I guess there's kind of a dual purpose. One is to understand what's causing these things. And the and that's the, really the scientific question. And then the operational question is, you know, what? How do you predict them, and what sort of impact do they have? So that's so if you're if you're operating a ham radio or an HF communication system, you want to be able to predict when these things happen and know what kind of effect they're going to have because that might, you know, affect your choices in operation. Sure. So and there's there's quite a few. I mean, this was pointed out by several different hams that will, you know, uh, some of them here and some, some elsewhere saying, you know, there's a lot of prediction sites already out there. Mm -hmm. Have we got to the, and this was my 80-20 rule mm -hmm. from the economic side. We spent a lot of money predicting historically, billions of dollars predicting propagation. Mm -hmm. Are we trying to get to the last 20% that's going to cost us 80% of the, the original <laughs> dollars to get that? If the answer is yes, that may not be, you know, and there's already sites that are doing a good enough job and no one's willing to pay for that, then it right. might be, that's maybe yeah. about as good as you're going to get because no one's willing well, to pay for it. Well, as I said, we're, we're very specifically interested in these traveling ionospheric disturbances. So I guess in some ways it is kind of like that last 20%, but that's where, that's where a lot of the interest, there's science, there's both scientific interest and operational interest in there. So if it, if it, in, if it, addresses either of those, either the science or the operations, that's going to be a big win. Yeah. If I and, and we're we are seeing things that we haven't seen before. Like if you look at if you look at my PhD work, by looking at just the um the climatology when these TIDs occur, these I was looking at medium scale traveling atmospheric disturbances in my PhD, we were able to see that it was much more linked, the climatology looks like it's much more closely associated with terrestrial or neutral atmospheric weather than it was with um, aurora in say space weather. And that, my result was kind of something, there were some papers that had pointed to that before, but none of them had shown it quite that conclusively. Mm. And now what with Diego, who's on here, um, he's been doing this manual search He's cementing that in even more, but he's showing that's true for large scale traveling atmospheric disturbances, which are generally thought to be a different class from medium scale. And so he's also showing that it's this neutral atmospheric climatology that's actually accounting for a lot of the um, a lot of the patterns that we're seeing. And I don't think that was appreciated before. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely pulling out new things. It's just sometimes getting there. Now, one of the things that I was thinking with this, that's very important, you know, I'm able to show in the whisper signal data itself, I've been able to show these large scale traveling ionospheric disturbances that Diego has been doing his work with, and he has a really nice result. But um, I haven't been able to look at smaller scale sorts of things, the medium scale ones. So I haven't been able to figure out how to get the resolution fine enough and what we're looking at to see those smaller scale structures, even though I believe those smaller scale structures are in there. And I'm very interested in any approaches that can somehow um, look at those smaller scale structures and resolve uh, those fine scale things that we're not able to resolve right now. So I'm very interested if the machine learning or the um, whatever detection techniques you come up with um, are able to resolve those smaller scale sorts of fluctuations. May I ask a question, please? Sure. Where is this data and what form is it available and in what format? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the data, uh, the noise and, 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 and uh, all the whisper spot data is available at whisperdaemon.org. Uh, if you go to that w uh, website that uh, Gwen has established is, is where the uh, data is uh, well, we, we scraped the WhisperNet database. So WhisperNet, right, which is the one that's been uh, most everyone uploads to, uh, is maintained by other people. 
but it's a very difficult. Uh, it doesn't really offer a a, a very a, a true uh, a query language interface. So uh, at Whisper Daemon, uh, and I'll I guess I should type that in. Uh, uh, I'm, then, I'm typing it in, Rob. Okay, okay. Uh, at Whisper Daemon, you will find uh, links to the uh, description of, of our scrape of WhisperNet. Uh, and the, uh, uh, in addition to supporting a full on SQL query of the database, we actually have two uh, scrapes, uh, two databases. One which is uh, based on uh, uh, extension of PostScript, uh, po uh, uh, Postgres, which is uh, 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 called Timescale. And that is a full on, associate, I guess, re relational database with full query uh, SQL series, uh, query support. There's a second copy <coughs> of the scrape that's in a, a database called ClickHouse. And that database uh, does not, I think, have quite, the, it has a, it, a slightly different syntax and limitations, but, um, but it is several orders of magnitude faster. Uh, so if you want to do queries, uh, using the ClickHouse database at Whisper Daemon, uh, you can uh, construct queries, and there are uh, pages that have been constructed by uh, that, that are offered by um, uh, others of our uh, Whisper. I have a, there's a kind of a, a, a infrastructure of Whisper Daemon contributors, one of whom is VK7JJ, uh, who is uh, uh, Phil, who has uh, created a, a, a a uh, web interface to do uh, queries of quick house, uh, click house and does uh, it's kind of a oh, it, it I never go to whispernet anymore because his interface is so vastly superior uh, to the one offered by uh, uh, by whispernet both in terms of speed and terms of the ability to construct uh, uh, full-on queries so that's uh, that's where the whispernet uh, uh, you can find that uh, both both forms of it. In addition, there's the noise data is there as well with the it, which is is unique to to WhisperNet uh, to Whisper Daemon. Go ahead, Bob. Again, yeah, quick question. So, how does this differ from Whisper Live? Um, I had already downloaded and built myself a database of matched observations from Whisper Live, and the noise data. If I could match it by received and transmit and time uh, would be fantastic. But uh, so what's the comparison there or would uh, I need to go with, back? Go Whisper, ahead. No, Whisper Live uses our, is, is a, is a interface into our database. So that's, Whisper Live was cre created by, um, by Arnie uh, <laughs> and he's, uh, and actually we host the Whisper uh, Live site is hosted on the whisperdemon.org. Oh, so you know. <laughs> okay, so now you're you, yeah you've already been looking into it. There's Arnie's uh, set of, of tables of you know of Grafana. Uh, there's a uh, and th those are he's been great. He's the he's the uh, person who introduced uh, Gwen and I to ClickHouse as a uh, and so uh, we have uh, we're hosting his his uh, his data. Uh, we're hosting his his Grafana pages and so on are hosted at our site. So I can get Bob, you only want to use that site if you're anyone who's doing queries because Kevin and I did some queries. Uh, I'm sorry, what were, you, were you talking to me? Yeah, I was just going to suggest, you know, I mean, yeah. I think, since you're talking about that is Kevin and I were just doing some, you know, broad open ended queries and it was as Rob already said, you, you want to use one of those databases, the, the DB. Um, uh, the time they, scale DB or the yeah, other the time one? scale is a little slow. Yeah, I, I wouldn't use that one, uh, but I'd use a click house one. Yeah, Kevin just pointed out it was taking us minutes to do even small queries. So it's it, it to, to Rob's point. Do, yeah, it's use does click it, house. Just does it support a lag house. function? Do you know? I don't know what the delay is, the latency. No, I, does it support the SQL lag function? I don't know, Kevin. No, no. We, I don't know if we tested that or not. I mean, we were just we were just trying to connect and sync, just just trying to yeah. do yeah. exactly what you're doing. We didn't get into it. We were yeah. just running into problems with the speed. Okay. You I'll, need I'll, to, yeah. You need to. If you there are as a uh, an introduction, I think Gwen uh, uh, posted uh, at Whisper Demon a um, 
uh, a introduction to uh, the the structure of the data and where you can find uh, find uh, information about uh, queries both into ClickHouse and into uh, uh, the the uh, um, uh, the the Postgres. Be, um, so I'd, I'd encourage you to go look there. And, and Arnie has been extremely responsive. He's uh, uh, very helpful in terms of uh, uh, telling you how to how to do that. Uh, also look at, at uh, uh, Phil's site, whisper.rocks, whisper.rocks. And uh, at, uh, in the advanced search uh, section of Whisper Rocks, you'll find uh, Phil has created a page where you can create our uh, fairly construct your own fairly sophisticated queries of the Qu QuickHouse database and, and display the uh, the results both in tabular form and in, on a map if you, is appropriate. I'm just looking to I'm actually doing some regression style modeling, uh -huh. um, and so I actually need to download the data to uh, oh. you know in CSV or. Oh. Well, you're all oh, okay. Well, it's available to you. Yeah, there's a there's a JSON I think to download, Bob. Yeah, yeah and yeah. there's also I think on the Whisper Live site uh, mentioning that you're trying to do comparison between point A and point B, uh, or station to station. I think Arnie has something that on the new site uh, on uh, on the Whisper Live site when he, uh, you can put in two different stations. Well, I actually have a database of match stations of several million okay. observations, yeah. so. I just hadn't heard about this noise level data, and it seems like it might be a good covariate to go into a model. Um, and so it's like, okay, do I start from the beginning and just re-download the data from this site here so I have the noise data already merged in, or do I just get the noise data from here and merge it in with my pared down database? So I just have to figure out what my approach is. Well. We'd, we'd be very happy to help you if we can. Uh, okay. uh, uh, the, the data is actually uh, uh, hosted and uh, have a couple of, of physical servers uh, uh, that are uh, located here in California at, at different different sites, uh, not not nearer to each other, so that uh, we we have uh, at least a, a full one to one redundancy on the data set. So if you if if uh, we have an earthquake or power outage or something. The, the data is, uh, uh, you know, at least to the extent that you have two two complete uh, sets of data, you, you you know, you're you're likely to find it it, it there. And occasionally, we when we have a, had uh, some failures, Glenn has been able to uh, uh, restore one of our two uh, back uh, sites uh, from the other. But the primary site uh, runs on a. Um, uh, I think it's a 12, 12 core Xeon server with 192 gigabytes of memory on it, uh, RAM. And um, actually the whole of the, the Whisper Net data set, uh, data set, I think all, what is it, 13 years, fits into RAM. I think it's it's a 50 or 60 gigabytes <laughs> of, of data, but uh, that's because into the ClickHouse uh, version of it, ClickHouse uh, stores the data in a compressed format. and um, which greatly accelerates the performance, uh, but of course introduces some uh, limitations into the uh, the kinds of queries you can do. Yeah, they're doing they're doing call and restore for those of you know. So, I will be in touch. Good. Okay. Well, you have our uh, contact information from yep. the uh, from from the web, uh, Whisper Demon website, which is where you can start. And uh, we. Uh, We'd look forward to any, any to, to, I mean, you know, Gwen and I have invested, uh, you know, a couple of years and, yeah, you know, a little bit of money. Not it's, it's, The servers actually are used. They're $200 each. It's amazing how cheaply you can get old servers. Uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, so we invested some time in the hopes that uh, people like you, I guess, Bob, would, would find this uh, data set useful. And, um, and, it's you know it offers two things to to uh, investigators I think one is extremely fast uh, uh, access uh, for queries of of, uh, uh, of the uh, spot database and then the unique set of data the the, the noise levels the, the noise levels are uh, data is extracted from the same wave files that are uh, recordings that from which the spots are extracted so uh, we uh, take a two minute long 
wave file, we process it with the whisper D utility out of uh, JTX, and that's where we get our spots. So it's the same binary that is run in JTX is used to generate the spots here. We don't try to change that. Uh, then after that processing goes on, there's a second pass where we do this analysis of the noise levels. The wave files are available. We could do other processing if someone wanted to come, you know, could could think of a other, you know, uh, information that could be extracted from these wave files. Um, uh, we could add on other processing steps, but I'm really uh, glad. I'm really glad you're saving those wave files. <laughs> well, I'm not saving the wave files though. Uh, fortunately, I, I now you know the the, the wave oh, so files. Not, but you you can process you can process them in different ways, is what you're saying. Yes, and and okay. I've and I, yes, I can absolutely process them. Of course, this processing happens at the uh, receive site, so the uh, your computational. Uh, 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 you know, resources are limited by what's, you know, the, the uh, uh, CPU at the receive site. Yeah. And at, at, at uh, KPH, it's a, that's a Pi 4, a single Pi 4 is doing all of this work. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, at uh, other sites where there's uh, multiple antennas and, and then multiple uh, uh, Kiwis, like at KFS, uh, 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 we have uh, four antennas, three directional antennas, and one omnidirectional. Uh, we actually have, uh, I actually have uh, five Kiwis, and uh, we're processing the data from all of them. That could not be done on a, a Pi 4. We're, we're running out on a, a little I, I5 server. So, and other other sites are using even more powerful servers. So, so and, and I think that we're going to be, uh, I think the analysis, the uh, extracting data from the wave files, I think could, you know, could consume almost as much CPU resources as one could envision. Uh, we are, I'm in the process of debugging the a ver new version of the uh, software that will, uh, in addition to the whisper, uh, extracting whisper spots is going to extract the new uh, FST4W spots. Um, and we may learn uh, in the hopes that we'll learn uh, more about propagation from the additional sensitivity of the uh, 4W, uh, the 4W modulation scheme. So, um, and, and doing that, especially, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, whisper, new whisper packet formats are th uh, formats are 30 minutes long. So, um, so if if you know a 30 minute uh, wave file is going to take you know, 15 times the CPU power of a uh, of, of a two minute wave file. So um, I, I expect that uh, we're going to see a lot of upgrades on CPUs going on that, uh, around the world as as uh, as as I deploy uh, the version three of uh, Whisper Demon. Hopefully, that will also encourage uh, more people to utilize this new uh, modulation scheme. And uh, from that, maybe we'll, uh, we're ho I'm hoping that we'll, we'll see people uh, moving, migrating to that new modulation scheme. And from that, we'll gain perhaps new uh, insights, new propagation events that weren't being seen, weren't seen previously. So and and less you. interference on the FT8 subband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yes, I, I, I well, I, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the only, you know, the one of the well, this is an aside. One of the bizarre things to me was that the, that for some reason they 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 put the four um, uh, W band two hundred hertz in the two hundred hertz above the the uh, whisper band on only on one sixty meters. I don't understand the motivation for that, uh, and and I can't. I, I, it it it's I'm not going to support that. You're you're going to people who use four W are going to on one sixty are going to have to put their signals in the regular whisper batch. So. So Nat, one of the things I'm working on uh, as a small project, just you know, just to manually hand crank it through. To your point of, you know, there's what I would call macro environmentals. That you looks like that's what you kind of studied in your uh, in your thesis versus the micro, which is a little bit more interesting to me because I, you know, it's, it's like saying, well, the unemployment rate's really high in the United States. Well, if you look in certain places, it's not that problem, right? So I'm trying to like pick a smaller 
bite sizable, chewable, what the success look like. And so one of the things that came up from Roland, who's running the network for the Beacon International Beacon Project is he said, Stu, of all the beacons, you got a kind of an interesting signal going down to the Antarctic, the, the German club. I'm mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. Well, what does that mean? He says, well, you, on 80 megahertz, you know, on, on 80 meters, like you got a round trip, like a regular weekly trip down there on 80 meters. Like, okay, is that, is that a big deal? I don't know. He goes, well, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. I, okay, well, maybe we'll take that between the Silicon Valley and Antarctic, the German station down the club. And we know which, what band it's happening on. And I can probably go backwards in time for at least six months where they have the data. And then we can kind of maybe look at noise and that, you know, it's a lot more bite sizable, uh, whether I hand crank it through to then address some of these characteristics that you're talking about. But, you know, right now it's, it, the project's been kind of so open-ended, like I, I don't even know where to begin because it's just like you're drinking from uh, the Hoover Dam. It just, mm-hmm. It's just too much data and I'm not sure what success would look like, but at least with the smaller bite-sizable uh, project where we can, you know, we can, we can do a select on a very specific <laughs> two points mm-hmm. of location and then look at the noise uh, in there. Cause I'm, as I track now, I'm looking at it. Okay. I'm, I got a pretty good pipeline on 40 meters and, you know, uh, and some of the other bands from my location is it, why, why do I constantly hit Antarctic on a regular basis? I don't know, but mm-hmm. at least I can start tracking noise to help out a little bit on that side. So that's kind of my general thought work so far is to explore that space in terms of noise. And then, you know, whatever we find, you know, of course we'll contribute that back out, but trying to do, much more macro version who just it's a you know the, the, the it's not my day job it's like i got a day job that pays bills mm-hmm. um, yeah. spots here too from antarctica or to antarctica rather to the same place okay 180 there you go uh, may i ask a, a dumb question please uh just so that i understand what we're talking about here please define noise what is noise uh oh. Well, uh, there's a long uh, article that uh, you'll find at uh, whisperdemon.org uh, that describes okay. the, the, the measurement technique. We, we, do, we do two measurements of the wave uh, on each of the two minute wave files. Uh, the um, RMS noise take, uses the uh, uh, SOX utilities uh, stats function, and we select uh, uh, the uh, a slice of, uh, I, don't, I forget, half a second, 500 milliseconds out of the first one second of the whisper packet. Each whisper packet, you know, uh, has a, uh, is supposed to start at, at second zero. Uh, at second one, the transmitter is supposed to start. So there should be silence on the band, on the whole band for the first second. Of course, there oh. isn't because people are about. Uh, so we uh, use this, uh, run socks on that and, and extract its RMS noise level across the whole band. It's about, uh, well, I think, I think we actually go beyond the 200 hertz, so it's about 375 hertz wide, uh, full spectrum RMS noise for that. Uh, there's a second, uh, 10 second uh, window at the end of the, from uh, a second uh, 110 to second 120, when all of the, uh, uh, transmitters are supposed to be turned off. And I think we select eight seconds out of the middle of that and, and you uh, run, uh, gotta have SOX run its RMS level. So that's the RMS level that we, uh, we, we uh, and then uh, we, uh, a statistic we put in, it's put in, uh, it put, you know, it's recorded in uh, DBM, uh, you know, uh, uh, intensity, those, those are Unfortunately, it can't really be calibrated because there's so many variables in the received received chains. But we attempt to do it at relative to a, a one hertz bandwidth uh, a DBM noise level. So, uh, you know, the background noise level of the receivers, uh, the Kiwis, is about minus one seven one fifty seven uh, uh, DBM per per root hertz. So uh, you'll you know we we normalize the 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 RMS level to that. Uh, to the one hertz level. The second um, technique that we apply to the same wave file is to uh, use uh, extract w- w- the whisper D utility. Actually, out- cannot be told to output a what's called a C2 file, which is an IQ file that, uh, that just covers the uh, the frequency bins uh, of the uh, whisper uh, uh, band. 
200 hertz whis whisper band. And we uh, run a Python utility that uh, converts that IQ into a um, FFT. And then we, uh, and the band width there are, uh, you know, I think they're two or three hertz wide. And we look at for bins, frequency bins that are uh, the quietest. And so that, and then we uh, pick the 30% uh, lowest uh, uh, intensity frequency bins. And that's across the whole two minutes. So that means that uh, uh, we're uh, we're kind of filtering out the signals, and but we're and we're looking over a longer period of time. So you saw in in Gwen's uh, charts, you could see both what are uh, uh, RMS and FFT. Sometimes we've called them C2 because they're derived from this C2 file, but they're uh, C2 and FFT are the equivalent, uh, you know, different names for the same uh, technique analysis technique. And in general, there's pretty good correlation between the two. Although, um, you know, when there's um, uh, uh, lightning and other, uh, you know, noise uh, uh, sources, uh, there, there can be, and of course, if there's a, 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 a interfering uh, signal, CW signal or others, uh, there uh, can be a tremendous uh, divergence between the two. In general, I think we found the FFT to be more, uh, a more reliable and useful insight into what what the background noise level is uh, coming in uh, from from the um, uh, from the site. In general, I think that one of the things that that we want to emphasize to those of you who are deploying Whisper receive sites, whether you use our uh, software or, or not, is that you really should look at your diurnal noise uh, level variation. And if you're not seeing the uh, kinds of, you know, at least 10 dB or more on 40 meters, uh, of course, much less on 20 and almost nothing on high frequencies. But if you're not seeing those levels of diurnal noise, background noise level variation, then you're very much, your, your site is, is very much limited by local, uh, locally generated noise and your ability to detect a whisper signals is impaired by all of that, that, that those background noise levels. And, and uh, you know, in principle, it seems like that the diurnal noise variation would be a way to calibrate the actual sensitivity of the receive system and, and, and get back to a, an absolute uh, signal level uh, number where you could uh, take a look at a site and say, okay, what is the antenna factor and the, and, and the effect of the transmission chain and, and the impairments or the noise figure of the uh, receive device and come up with an actual um, way of, of saying, what is the absolute signal level of the whisper uh, spots that you're getting? Because right now it's all SNR, it's, it's relative. And uh, I, it would be, I think, a, you know, a valuable contribution for us to be able to say, how and what's the signal levels, absolute signal levels of these spots that are coming in for different places. So looking, you know, we've been looking kind of for a, a way to calibrate. And, and in a sense, the, uh, the atmospheric noise level is a signal generator that one could use to calibrate the, uh, the absolute sensitivity of a site. And, um, uh, and, and I think that would be a, a worth, you know, studying how if that if that's true and and how to do that, I think would be an ex a valuable contribution uh, to any uh, uh, use of the of the Whisper uh, database, uh, the Whisper Net or, or our, our clone of it. Hey, Rob, can I just jump in for a second? Hey, JB, you know, given your math background, what would be very interesting is to create a score, just like a. <laughs> FICO score on yourself, okay? We're talking about a, a maidenhead score in general, like a baseline. So if you got, I don't know how many whisper stations are out on there, it was a 4,000 plus around the world, choose a number, you know? But in the areas where populated, trying to create a, a noise floor, right? Okay, that's one of that, your, co your coefficients, for a given location, you got one there. Okay, and then we have general mad may noise and we keep seeing that sine wave that Gwyn's talking about. Okay, I live next to the Hoover Dam. Yeah, go figure. You're gonna get this kind of noise level. That's expected. There's your next covariant, right? Yeah. And then you're gonna have other wacky stuff. You're gonna get the black swan events, right? You're gonna get a black swan event, like a, a, a solar flare that's massive or some other space weather. That's stuff that's uncontrollable, right? But at least we know with, you got a couple scores, 
here's your predictability score about hearing a given signal barring a black swan event. And then, you know, you got the firmware guys on here saying, hey, tune your, tune your filters accordingly, given what you know, done. That's what success to me would look like on, on something like this at a macro, at a micro, as opposed to macro level, right? You got all the sock chips out there now that are doing all this wonderful GPU compute. This is, you know, you got enough data probably going into, you know, Rob, uh, when your server is there to be able to do something a little bit more surgical. So if you're able to actually get a score by Maidenhead and just try a couple different locations of what's known known noise, man-made noise in the area that you expect, what's your normal background noise, Again, these could be band specific. And then on any given day, you should be able to hear from Stu going into Antarctica on any given day, except for these black swan events. And we, we can't control that. Why does that happen? You know, there's a million reasons why, right? You've got modulations in space, all the ionization, whatever's going to happen, right? But at least you're taking, you're taking stuff off the table you know, half the problem, I think, is just figuring out what's not relevant or what's known knowns and then just getting down to the, you know, the unknowns. And so I think we're so early on that if you can do something along those lines, that would be a lot more helpful. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I'll need to look at the data. I'm thinking higher order statistics. That's what I'm thinking at right now. There you go. Okay. There, you, there you go. <laughs> anyway, here, here is here is the a page from the uh, Arnie's. I'm sharing a page from Arnie's database where he does uh, he provides down here in the Whisper Demon graphs area of his page provides a set of of of, of pages that allow you to look at uh, uh, compare uh, sites. Uh, the noise levels, and so I I just picked two sites that are uh, active right now. So here's KFS and K7OEI, and we're looking across different bands. So you can see the um, uh, uh, he doesn't he's he doesn't do the uh, uh, colors right. Um, he doesn't show the colors up here, but the uh, you can see that uh, you know uh, let's see I I think uh, this is. I think this is uh, you. You can see that uh, you know diurnal variation on one side and uh, on um, and in the uh, let's see that's at fifteen. Well, we're not going to see much. If we go down to if we go down to forty meters here. Here's an example of comparing two sites using the same antenna, the same receivers, a uh, thousand uh, kilometers apart. Um, yeah, is, when you're when you're using those, because I and Rob, you've been on some of those emails I'm giving back to uh, Roland and Arnie. Uh, JB, if you're looking at that stuff, just be yeah, be really careful on those color coordinations. And sometimes I've noticed also oh. how it's doing the regressions. It's real touchy. So just assume yeah. that if you see the data, at least you know you can access the data. How you want to represent it, maybe it gives you a broad North Star. I can see the sun, but I can't yeah. tell anything else, right? Yeah. That's yeah. basically what you're going to get from that. But if you're trying to really do something predictable, the, the, the regressions and the math that they're using to, to do these correlations is, 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 is pretty rough. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's just to let you know, there's a, a kind of, there's a, a first insight uh, you know, uh, view into the noise uh, database available uh, through Arnie's pages. Thank you. This looks interesting. Thank you. Uh, James, K8OS, I've just sent you an email to your qrz.com email address with a reprint of the QEX article, which goes into detail on your question about what noise is represented and uh, also what noise is not included, uh, just as useful. Thank Can you, you post that to the chat or the link to it on the chat? Um, it's not available online because ah. of uh, copyright and um, ARRL. Mm. So um, I don't want to get in trouble with them. So I'm happy to send a reprint uh, personally, but not to post it online. Um, would you like a copy, Bob? Uh, yes, please. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, anyone else, just, just email me uh, for it, and I'll gladly send a personal copy. Thanks, Gwyn. Thank you. I'm going to have to jump off. I got to go back to my day job here. Um, a little past my lunch hour. So, um, but it's a pleasure meeting uh, with all of you. Thanks for uh, Nat for hosting and allowing me to chime in here for whatever 
two cents as worth today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. We so have these, Thanks, we man. have these big group meetings every other week, yeah. and then in the right. off weeks, if you ever needed like individual conversation, no, no, I could no. do something like that. But um, sure. you know, uh, thank you for coming, and I oh, hope we have you back in the future. Awesome. So we are definitely over time. Um, Rob, do you have any other questions or Gwen or anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no, I just want to encourage everyone who is interested in this, who finds this uh, of interest, uh, we welcome uh, uh, emails and queries and uh, uh, on the subject. Uh, I'll put my email in here just in case it's uh, uh, lost elsewhere. And uh, and uh, if you is if this is of interest, or if you're interested in in just setting up your uh, Whisper Receive site um, uh, uh, using uh, uh, well, you know, it's, right now it's primarily Kiwis, uh, um, then uh, then I'd be happy to help you do that. Uh, we've we've done a lot of work in antenna systems and how to optimize. Uh, and optimize the receive site to uh, get the most, uh, uh, the best whisper spot and whisper data, uh, whisper noise data out of it. So. Uh, Thank you. Just so perhaps much. a quick update on uh, what I may find myself doing in the next few months along the lines uh, that, that I explained in the slides. Um, because of a technical problem and then no access during COVID, KPH was not available for over a year or so. Um, and really because it is the premier low local noise site, it is a, an excellent detector perhaps of, of what's going on. Um, and then not quite as good on the low noise as Northern Utah SDR site, and then Rob and I had recruited two normal amateur radio sites okay. in Nevada, um, one slightly better than the other. Uh, but part of my ambition now is to see if we can detect those signatures at KPH. What do we see at Northern Utah and the two sites in Nevada? So that, that's a question which might then give you an array of four stations mm -hmm. to try and get some of that directionality that Nathaniel would like. Um, and, and what has also happened uh, not so long ago with KFS and its directional and omnidirectional antennas, uh, each with a Kiwi in the same noise environment locally, is that can we see differences in the noise signatures by antenna? And does that again give us some idea about directionality of these signatures that we see in the noise data? So mm -hmm. that, that's me busy for the next few months. That sounds great. And I know my student Veronica is working on implementing um, a technique for uh, doing the triangulation of detecting the direction of these uh, TID motions in the great personal space weather station data. And I think looking at your data, if you have this same sort of data from uh, multiple receive stations, that approach may be able to be adopted to this. So yeah. we'll see how that comes out. We're working yeah. on it too. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so you, you'll find it. I mean, it's, uh, these sites are, are of course present in the whispernet.org data. So uh, the, the, spot, the spot data is all there. And, mm. uh, and there's so, you know, as I said earlier at the beginning, there's about 20, 20, well, there's a total of about 50 sites running Whisper Demon. So, uh, and for noise, many of them are the, uh, are the top 20 or 25, uh, I'd say out of the top 25 spot, spotting stations worldwide, about 20 of them are running um, a Whisper Demon. So they had so there's noise data as well as uh, spot data available from them, um, and that's that's pretty high quality stuff, you know. Uh, and and they and they're running all bands, you know. Typically they're running at, at least six bands simultaneously, and many of the sites are running all fourteen bands simultaneously all the time, you know. That's great. So um, yeah, that's part of it. Is just gathering more data, you know, it, it didn't want to, uh, the scanning you can do if uh, sites that run JTX can at best do one band or, or, or do band hopping. Mm -hmm. And then, so you end up with, with gaps 
both in the whispered daemon of uh, the, the spot reception as well as in the um, um, uh, uh, in the in the noise, of course, the noise level data. So um, uh, we're, we're the whispered daemon running sites are the, a better source of a more complete set of data set. That sounds great. Okay. So we, thank you. We exhaust everyone. <laughs> I think this is great. It's really nice having you. <laughs> well, thank you. Appreciate your interest. And uh, we welcome any suggestions on how, I think one area that, that I have no idea is, I, I, you know, is, is could we do another, other kinds of analysis on the wave files? I mean, you know, they're there. I could, I could upload them, yeah. you know, that, but, but, you know, typically a two minute long wave file is about three, three megabytes. Yeah. So, um, so it's a not not a trivial uh, thing to store, and it's not compressible. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, the extent you compress it, loss of compression, you lose all the noise, <laughs> the interesting <laughs> noise data. So, uh, right. So you really need to to to, uh, uh, to but but uh, we could do other analyses. Mm -hmm. and I but I have never I haven't really thought of any others, but that's probably yeah, more. The the one that comes to mind right now, of course, is Doppler, but I'm not sure that that, um, you know, I don't know. Well, I mean, to the extent that, you know, Whisper Demon does output a, a, a you know, a Doppler number in the Whisper mm -hmm. D output, and that's recorded in the, the, the database. But I'm not sure that that's, um, you know, I don't think that's, that's uh, necessarily very useful. We do have, um, some uh, Clint at, at K7OEI has been recording uh, WWV and CHU and several other uh, uh, sites uh, recording their uh, uh, signal levels using Whisper Demon. Yeah. So it, I wonder it, if I wonder if even just um, you know doing a spectrogram of the two minute of uh, of the two minute wave file. Yeah. Into a PN into a PNG or, you know, if that's useful at all. Um, it, it doesn't sound hard to do, is that yeah. right? I mean, that's a, um, right. I, I uh, but I think you'd have to, you'd want to look at individual signals within the, would you, you'd want to, you'd want to identify signals and look at the spectrogram of them, so. I would think so, but I, yeah. I you know, th this, I'm just talking. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, think of, if you can think of uh, something, I, I, I'll, I'll show you, you know, how you could plug in a, a uh, uh, you know, a, I could, I could add an optional feature to plug in a processing, uh, uh, you know, execute a, a processing stage at the end of each uh, whisper capture and, yeah. uh, and, and hand off these wave files to, uh, you know, a, uh, any command that you could, you, you want to suggest or supply. Yeah. So um, I, I'd like to, I think that would be interesting because I, I think we're, you know, I, I don't, but I don't know of other, you know, I, I, I well, I haven't had time to really think about yeah. it. As a, you know, D David Kasdan, he's not on here anymore, but um, he seems like the type of person that might be thinking of this sort of thing. Well, okay. Well, if, if I have to ask David to, I think he's, um, um, it would be, uh, I'd be happy to help. As I Great. Say. So. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Well, pleasure too. We'll see you at the sometime at the next uh, uh, Tangerine uh, uh, SDR or some other uh, such event. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was fun. Know. Thanks a lot. Okay. Very good. Learned a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Exciting stuff. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Seven three. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.